This is Mihai Malemare. I'm the cinematographer for Jojo Rabbit, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director, a producer, and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Today we invite Mihai Malimar Jr. back on the show to talk about his work as director of photography for Jojo Rabbit. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, buy, rent, create at rule.com, and Post Lab, stress free collaboration for Final Cut Pro. Well, I am just plain excited. Excited! There's so much going on. The Oscars are coming up. Go Creative Show is doing very, very well. My production company is doing very well. It's, it's been a great, 2020 has been a fantastic year so far. I have to say, we're only a month in, but you know what? I'm going to take this as a sign that this year is going to be a great one. And speaking of Oscars, at Go Creative Show, we've had, what is this, two, four, five. Today is going to be the sixth, this episode is the sixth film covered uh, on Go Creative Show that is nominated for Oscars this year. That's crazy. We had um, the production designer for Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. Uh, we had the cinematographer for Knives Out uh, in Ford vs. Ferrari. We had the director and cinematographer for uh, The Lighthouse. And of course, Lauren Schur, director of photography for Joker. And then today, Mihai Malimar Jr. from Jojo Rabbit. So th- we've, we've got you covered, people. Go see the films, come back to Go Creative Show, listen to these episodes. If you haven't listened to them for the first time, if you have, listen to them again, because you know we're packing in tons of information and knowledge for you guys, and it's so fun. We love it. Now, you're going to hear some audience questions in this episode, and that's because whenever we have upcoming guests, we let you know on our social media pages and give you an opportunity to have your voice heard and have your question heard. So if you aren't already, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We will always let you know what's coming up and um, you get a chance to have your question heard on the show. And of course, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. So our conversation with Mihai is coming up in just a moment, but I want to talk to you quickly about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. They have an insane amount of equipment in their warehouse there. They've been in business for nearly 40 years, so you can imagine what they have. We're talking cameras, lighting, lenses, communications, uh, camera dynamics, movies, black arms, everything you need. And new to the family is the Sony FX9 and Canon C500 Mach 2. So that just goes to show you they are always at the cutting edge. They are the, have the latest and greatest. They have the best. They are the best. Everything you want is there at Rule Boston Camera over at Rule.com. Now, we're always talking about their attentive service, and that's because they understand production is mission critical, and they have your back. You're going to get technical guidance when you take the equipment out, and they're going to support you for the entire time you have their stuff in your little hands. And that's what you want is peace of mind. So between attentive service, a world-class inventory, and now the new Sony FX9 and Canon C500 Mach 2, Rule is where you need to go for everything. Check it out for yourself over at rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. All right, let's jump right into our interview with Mihai Malimar Jr., the director of photography for Jojo Rabbit. So I'm here with Mihai Malimar Jr., the director of photography for Jojo Rabbit, and this is your return visit to Go Creative Show, so welcome back. (laughs) Thanks for having me again. We had you on for The Hate You Give, I think, and um, uh, which is another great film. Of course, Jojo Rabbit now nominated for Movie of the Year. I mean, what a whirlwind this past year must have been. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was. When you got this script for the first time, what were your thoughts? I mean, I wasn't uh, entirely surprised because I, I knew and admired uh, Taika's work. Uh, and knowing his other movies, I kind of uh, I, I, it was it didn't didn't come as a surprise for me. Uh, but uh, definitely, nevertheless, it's it, it's interesting. It's a it's a strange uh, subject uh, to to dive into, and especially with a lot of comedic elements, but I, I realized right away that, uh, as in his other movies, Taika is using comedy for, for a bigger purpose and for uh, most of the times for relaxing the audience so he can deliver a much more important message. 
um, I was I was really excited reading it. Well, it's I mean an unbelievable script. The movie is fantastic. Yeah. I just finished I just finished watching it this morning. Actually, um, <laughs> I didn't get a chance to see it in the theater, but uh, it, it's just it's so compelling. And I think the way that you guys use comedy is really interesting because it it sort of lures you into this sense of like you said calm and immediately after it's a misdirection and it shows you a horrific image. Like it's, it's pretty yeah. amazing how you're able to do that multiple times in the yeah. film. You know, yeah. I, I, uh, you know, that was actually one thing I wanted to ask specifically is the way that you handled misdirection when you're pairing together comedy and something really tragic and, and where you see it um, a couple times are the feet dangling in the city yeah. square yeah. Uh, I think there were twice that that happened and both times were just as shocking. Um, how do you do that from a cinematography standpoint? Uh, it's, it's a fine line that you, you have to, to walk. And, and we, we, we spoke about it very early on and, and, and trying to, to figure out what would be the best approach because, uh, it is like, I, 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 I think I, 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 I treat it most of the times I treat it like a love story and trying to, not necessarily ignore the comedic elements or or or, or the drama parts of, of it, but like trying to find a balance where you don't give away the fact that uh, you will use comedy for for something else, and uh, it's 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 so so interesting how um, uh, usually like people are thinking of like a really bright uh, high key image when they think of comedy and a really dark moody. Uh, lighting when they when they think of drama, so it's like how do you achieve both and still make uh, make a movie that uh, doesn't jump very very far from like you know it's it's it, it took some time, but I think what it did what did the trick for us is like as soon as we discovered that and it, it's something that it came from all the departments as soon as we discovered that. We don't want to shy away from color, and actually, color saturation would be our friend for for this story. Uh, then everything was was easy. I think it's uh, like finding that element that uh, is also different from all the other approaches. Because when you're thinking of World War II movies, they're all and uh, most of all, they're like the desaturated and uh, almost like monotone and and like monochromatic, and you're. Uh, just having that approach would like kind of we realize that that will put us uh, uh, in, in a different like it's it, it's something that I don't know exactly if it was done before, but in the same time it, it worked for us very well because it was uh, just thinking that we have to tell the story through a ten year old kid's eyes and 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 also the fact that. Um, it's very close to reality. They were really bright colors during that that period, and we all had the same the same feeling the first time we watched color images from World War II because we were so used to black and white images. And 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 uh, as soon as I, I remember when I when I saw for the first time, I think it was a BBC documentary. When when I saw color footage from World War II, and I was shocked because in my mind was that everything was like much more like toned down. Yeah. Uh, and and as soon as we realize that that's the best approach uh, we can have for this uh, for this movie, I think everything uh, everything worked out in, in the end. Um, I just want to bring everybody up to speed. If the if you haven't seen Jojo Rabbit, just at its at its most basic, it's a story of a young ten year old boy who's in Hitler's army, and he finds out that his mother is hiding a Jewish girl in their home. Um, Comedy ensues. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really wild setup to a relatively small movie as far as like a storyline goes. Like it's encapsulated in a small period of time. Um, not a ton of actors in there. Uh, you know, you go back to the same sets multiple times. And I think what, you know, we're talking about right now is the use of color because People have often associated uh, sort of World War II movies with black and white. And if you are incorporating color, it's kind of in a desaturated way. And this is totally different. This is warm, uh, bright, colorful. Um, and, I, and, and personally, I think the approach is great because you're kind of seeing 
this world through the youthful and ambitious eyes of our main character, who's a 10-year-old boy, who idolizes, you know, Hitler and this whole Nazi, Nazi movement. And, and it's something I remember, it was uh, just watching uh, costume samples, you know, from, from that period. And we realized like that was color everywhere. Uh, and that's why I'm saying it came from all the departments, like from from our production designer. When we when we saw the the first sketches, we we realized like there was coloring materials and in, in, like everywhere around them. So um, that's why I think it, for us it was the, the perfect tool, and uh, that allowed us to to have scenes that were uh, like brighter than than in a, in a drama, for example, but not as bright as a comedy. And there were scenes that were like uh, way darker, like in the in the hiding space. Um, and and I kind of enjoyed that, like not not working by recipe and trying to figure out as we as we go. There was also a lot of strong kind of patterns, and you know the the colors that you did bring in were kind of unique. Like you had that very bold green, and um, that was kind of spattered throughout the house. Of course, you had the Nazi red. You were playing a lot with colors, and um, I thought that was really unique. Certainly, a lot of that is in production design, but in a in a film like this, when you are incorporating so many colors and they're becoming a strong, you know, visual component to the storytelling, how are you involved in those decisions? Uh, I mean, it's it's interesting because that's why it's good to be on the on the same page, and uh, because you can have a very colorful set, but uh, uh, just from from uh, um, from like CDLs and and just from the uh, certain choices you 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 have from like lenses to what type of lighting and and all that you can uh, you can change that that saturation. So uh, we of course we had the costumes and the and and the sets which were amazing all of them, but uh, we also didn't shy away from from saturation. We actually. Uh, we, we try to enhance that with, uh, with with our tools, but also it was something that was very interesting because uh, it's also a, it's all, always about contrast. Like we knew that all this color saturation at the beginning of the movie will give us the chance to shift the tone towards the end, where where things get more monochromatic and and. Um, just thinking about the, the the battle scenes, we we knew that like the amount of smoke and explosions that will kind of help us achieve a, a, a more monochromatic, uh, colder tone towards the end, and and that's why it's like the the color in the beginning was was a, a, a an amazing tool for us to be able to shift the tone later, and that's why I mean. Uh, about when I when I talk about contrast, like you need something to counter it with, so so the other becomes more important. They they both exaggerate each other. I want to talk about your uh, creative working relationship with the director um, Taika. Uh, he was your director, but he also was uh, a cast member. He was you know one of the leading roles. He was playing Hitler. Uh, yeah. Have you ever before worked with a director who was also acting in the film? And um, you know what? How does that change the relationship that you have with them? Uh, no, it was my my first time, and uh, it, it was uh, it was scary thinking about it. But but on the other hand, why was it uh, scary? Just just the amount of of, of time uh, you think it might take from when you sh- when you finish a scene or or even a shot and. And trying to figure out how to 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 um, to have that in your schedule where he can go back to the monitor and watch playback for uh, just to make sure he likes everything. Uh, it's it, it, just just from that perspective, and it can be challenging. But sometimes, but very rare, he he did that, and and a, a lot of times, I think it's also because uh, he. Uh, he he likes to trust people and also like he surrounded himself like with uh, with, with people that he worked with before so uh, I, I it's like i think filmmaking is is definitely uh, teamwork but also it's it, 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 there is a lot of trust involved and uh, uh, it was way easier than i thought it would be a lot of times we just shoot and we move on just knowing that we 
we, we got that without needing to go back to the monitor and watch everything again. Hmm. And that question came from Levi Ingram on Instagram. I just wanted to give you credit sure. there, Levi. Um, I, I want to go just a little bit more into that because I'm thinking like, if if the director is in front of the camera doing his performance, yes, you can certainly do playbacks, but does that put more of the responsibility on the AD for watching for performance in the monitor? Yeah, and and, and pretty much for um, on the others, uh, like Carthy, our producer, was constantly watching the monitor, and mm. like even even. Uh, even raw or production is there were so many so many uh, people from the crew that were uh, at the monitor the, the whole time um, for me it's also a little bit different because i'm 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 operating a camera so uh, uh it was actually better because i was closer to <laughs> to taika uh, the whole time so um oh you were operating during this yeah yeah so that's why i wasn't far away at a monitor watching it and then regrouping i was in the same room with him the whole time. Do you prefer to do that for your films to operate? I I do, and I think I mean uh, I think it's 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 the way I learned because I I, I uh, did the film school in Romania and it's it's the European way. So it was always like this. The, the cinematographer was also the operator, and uh, s slowly, of course, like. Uh, it was very hard. Like the first time I had to do, a, uh, I had to shoot a movie with multiple cameras. I, I was terrified. But then I think if you if you embrace it and if you if you use a crew that you you trust, then then that becomes very easy as well. But I think it's 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 because it's the way I learn. Sometimes I I light for what I'm framing and I'm framing for what I <laughs> while what I lit. So that's uh, that's my approach. It just, it does seem like operating would be the optimal thing. Like, I mean, I understand why people would have camera operators so that they can look at the monitor and watch it more objectively, maybe. But I don't know, there's just, it, there's just kind of a fluidity to, you know, having the camera and having, you know, pressing the button and like being the one there behind you know, behind the viewfinder. I don't know. It just, it feels like I don't really shoot that much, but if I, if I did, I feel like that would be how I would want to do it as well. It is. But on the other hand, you know, you, you know, it's like, uh, you can have, uh, that's what's great about our, our, uh, job is that, uh, the same thing can be achieved in a hundred different ways. And, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily the, the best way It's just the best way for me. Uh, I, I totally understand that there are like amazing operators out there that can give you way more than you would uh, you would be able to do sometimes. Course, yeah. But it's all about the process and, and the way you're you're used to certain things, I guess. I want to talk about camera movement. PT Camara Schnitt on Instagram he wants to know how did you decide when to move the camera and when not to. The, the process was was very uh, very interesting because uh, we for for example we storyboarded only the the war scenes and uh, we we knew we had to do that just because there are so many elements involved and when you when you go into storyboarding uh, you you plan ahead and then a lot of uh, like about framing and camera movements and everything else uh, when when it when it comes to to the other uh, the other scenes we, we decided to have a, a totally different uh, different approach and that was uh, just going and, and rehearse with, with the actors and uh, then block and then figure out how to how to shoot it and what that does it, it gives so much so much freedom to the actors and that's what I realized that's how Taika gets these amazing performances from from young actors. But that being our main approach, we had to to determine early on during prep um, a certain set of rules. And um, we, first of all, we we realized that this is not the movie for handheld. And we we knew from the beginning we don't want to be handheld ever. So why did um, why did why did you decide that? We felt that uh, uh, it might be too, I think, too modern, uh, too, too much of a modern approach. Uh, and we wanted uh, something uh, like a, a, a classical element because we felt that our color approach would be so different than, than 
uh, people were expecting that like if we if we, if we felt it wasn't right and a lot of times like I guess that's why we felt it wasn't right that we felt it was too modern and uh, we wanted a more classical approach um, and we we realized that like dolly shots and and uh, just slow moves or like really perfectly composed static shots can can work really well and when you have these set of rules, then you, you jump into rehearsing them and, and trying to figure out on the spot. But having this background and all the discussions in, in prep will, will allow you to, to, to realize like, oh, we, actually, this can be a dolly shot. and It will help us to, to have a dolly shot here. But a lot of times we, we weren't trying to do a dolly shot just because it's a cool camera move. We we're trying to, to figure out if there is a certain meaning for that or if that can... Uh, give the audience a certain emotion better than a static shot. Can you pinpoint um, a shot that you decided to move the camera where you thought, you know, the decision was made to accelerate the story or to support whatever was going on at that moment? I, I mean, there's like the, the, the one that uh, was jumping my mind really first would be like uh, following Jojo when he goes back to to, uh, to Elsa's bedroom with with a knife and that could have been like a really composed uh, shot, and we we did a few of those before, but we felt that just dolling with him for that moment will will kind of bring the the, the audience with him into that scene. Mm. Um, um, I'm trying to find uh, a few others. Like sometimes it's just it's just the fact, the reality of it, the fact that you have to bring a character from one room to another somehow. Yeah. But you can achieve that with either multiple static shots or just like a long uh, dolly track. And it depends, like it depends, uh, like a, a, a lot of times it's uh, what it feels right uh, in that moment. There's one move in particular that I wanted to talk to you about is when uh, there's a point in the movie where the camera sort of rotates through the bedroom, uh, rotates yeah. around the bedroom, and, you know, you're going through daylight, nighttime, you know, the main characters are in different parts of the room, just to kind of show the passage of time. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you how you achieve that scene, uh, that look? We, we we spoke about that very early on, and, and uh, we, we refer to it as, uh, as a Taika signature shot, because he did that in... Uh, and for uh, older people, and uh, he it, it was a, a really nice way I thought uh, for showing the passage of time, um, and uh, we didn't realize it's uh, it's even even harder to do it because he did it in a in, a, in an open space in a forest, uh, but for for Jojo we, we 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 chose the bedroom and we didn't realize it's it's actually way harder because. We wanted to, to do it as much in camera as possible and have the actors run uh, and change position as the pan, as the camera is panning. But uh, in, in, in such a tight space, it's actually harder to, to do. And um, if, if we were able to achieve two or three spots, we, we weren't able to achieve all the, all the move. So we needed some, some help from, from VFX there. But I think the idea was to, um, to show just show the passage of time in, in one room and where they can be different spots and, and different different uh, times of, of day. And what was great about it is that we were able to achieve the, the, the passage of time like from daytime to, to nighttime in, in a continuous move. And that wasn't the effects, but repositioning and, and trying to make it diff multiple passes so, so we have a tighter um, positioning of the characters we, we need to use the effects for, for that. So you just sort of plant the camera in the middle and automate it and move and just kind of like set your scene and did a full rotation? Is that? Uh, pre pretty much, yeah. I mean, for that one, I, I used a, a gear head with, with reduction gears. So, and still uh, um, like a, a better tool. I think we, we, we tried one more time in the, in the living room and that didn't make the cut, but we... Um, we tried it with a repeatable head, uh, and it's something. It's something to it. I mean, sometimes you want the the human imperfections in any camera move, um, but sometimes like those will work against you when you have to stitch shots together. Yeah. Um, but it was it was fairly fairly basic. On a, I remember we were fairly low on a, on a low head with a, with a gear head with a reduction gear, and just panning as slow as possible. 
So you tried one in the living room, but it just didn't work? No, it, it did, but it was a totally different uh, different moment. And, and for some reason, within the cut, within the story, the bedroom uh, setup worked, worked better. How does that feel to... I can imagine that there's probably so much stuff that you shoot that you may be really proud of. And then to just not see it in the film, I mean, obviously you've been in the business for a while now, I'm sure it becomes old hat, but does it still kind of irk you when there's something you wanted so badly to be in there uh, and it isn't? Does that bother you? It, it, it doesn't. And it, it's really interesting because uh, it's it used to. And uh, But very early on um, in the film school in, in Romania, we, we had to take um, editing classes. And when you have to, to edit something yourself, you realize how how, how everything changes. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why and I, I was lucky. I mean, I, I worked for, I did two movies uh, when uh, with, with Francis Coppola when the editor was Walter Murch. So just being in the editing room and see how, how things can, can change and they can evolve even more than you, you thought they will while you're shooting. You have to, to, to train yourself and, and, and learn how to, to, to give up and give away shots that you, you like and, and realize what's better for the story and for the, the movie as a whole. Uh, so it, it's interesting. It, it, it should probably, but it doesn't, doesn't bother me at all. That's such a great skill to have for cinematographers, <laughs> I think. Like, I, I, I mostly, like, when I'm, when I'm working in my studio, uh, I, I edit a lot. So I have, I have a lot of editing experience. I'm mostly a commercial director. But having that, having that editing skill, I think, is just so valuable because I think it makes you a better shooter. It makes you a better director. It certainly makes you understand more when scenes are left on the cutting room floor uh, like we're talking about now, and it just helps you understand storytelling. Definitely, and I mean, there, there's, I, I, I have a perfect example from like when we were shooting Youth Without Youth with with Francis in Romania, and then Walter was was editing and also sound mixing, and I remember I implored him. I had one shot that I hated, uh, and I, I was talking to him like, "Oh, Walter, please cannot you, can can you find something else and not use that shot." Or is there a way I can reshoot that or do something like that? And he was like, no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And the, the first time I saw the, the, the final um, edit with sound, he came to me after the screening and the screening and asked me, and uh, like, what did you think about that shot? And I didn't realize, I was like, oh, I, I never, is that still in? And he was laughing. He was like, yeah, you, you see, I knew that will be a certain music there and I'll have a certain amount of bass. You can't even... Uh, feel the fact that you used to hate that shot, uh, and that's when I realized not only editorial, but how how important is sound in, in, in everything. Now you have to tell us what the shot was, so that we can go back uh, and watch. Honestly, honestly, I really don't remember. <laughs> you just remember it you was, hated it. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. It was something. It had to do with with a certain shadow or something. I'm pretty sure it was a minor thing, but like in that great scheme of things, you you know, like oh, there was one shot I hated. <laughs> But it's it's so interesting how how all the elements together they they can change the perception so much. Talk to me about the sets in Jojo Rabbit. Um, how much was a set, and how much were actual locations? All all, all the interiors in in Jojo's house the, they were built. Uh, so that, that that was amazing. Like what what Ra did there was really great because we found a, an exterior we we liked, and he tried to. To, to make that work really well. Of course, like we, we had to use the, the front door and there's the, the scene with the Gestapo guys coming to Jojo's house. It yeah. was fairly tricky for, for everybody because there was a corridor in the actual um, exterior location and we, the, our corridor was much wider. But like we, we somehow we made it work and I think because he thought about all the architecture elements and kind of where every, where all the rooms might be, uh, it worked really, really well. But uh, pretty much all the all the interiors of Jojo's house we, we built. So that scene at the door was on location. Is that what uh, you're saying? Half, uh, or did you guys use like a background plate and put it on green screen? We wanted to do that, but it's uh, it's always tricky, and especially with with that many people. So uh, from from inside the house, looking out when the Gestapo guys are opening the door, that's in a real location. 
which was our exterior uh, location for Jojo's house. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look back at Jojo, that's in the stage. Okay. Uh, so it was a fair amount of, of uh, light matching and, and color grading <laughs> there to make it work, but it's it, it does feel uh, seamless now when I when I watch the movies. It's fairly great. Fairly great. One thing I noticed as kind of a common um, visual element throughout the film is your use of uh, framing. Um, you know, you certainly have some very traditionally framed shots, but then you also have things that are very unique, like uh, there'd be a, a ton of negative space in the shot where, um, oh, I'm so bad with names, Elsa and, no, I'm sorry, Rosie and Jojo are out, Jojo. they're out like in a park and there's this big, huge set of stairs and you have a giant wide shot with them kind of in the lower left. Um, it, that one that one stood out to me. There was also some shots that played with the height differences between, um, oh God, it, it was that part of that scene that you're talking about where people entered, where they entered the house and kind of looking through the house. Um, oh my God. Yeah, with, with, with Stephen and... Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes. You play on the fact, you know, the height of that character. Um, and you also have to just by you know, sheer physics, our main character is a 10 year old boy. So he's a lot shorter than everybody, but you have to play with people's heights. You have to play with unique framing. You have to put adults and kids in the same shot. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how you crafted the framing for the film. Uh, I mean, it has a, a lot has to do with, uh, with, with common things that uh, Taika and I liked or, or hated, you know, it's, it's, the first time I knew we'll get along was when I saw him early on in prep. I saw him using a Hasselblad X pad, ah. and and that's a panoramic camera that shoots on two frames. And I have the same camera, and I'm using it a lot. And and the reason I knew we'll get along is that when you use that camera, you have to love perfect horizon and, and symmetry. Otherwise, you won't be able to <laughs> to shoot that camera really well. So there, there are certain things we discovered early on that we, we both like. We, we like symmetry. We like perfect horizon. And also, I think because uh, he likes uh, still photography as well, and I'm, I'm crazy about still photography, there's a certain type of, of, of negative space in, in a still that like, I think it's, very, it's pretty great if we can embrace that and then use it in, in, in movies. And... Um, all, all these things I remember we, we spoke about in, in prep and, and looking at, at, at certain steels and, uh, um, and and we we knew that we want to use that for sure. And a lot of times, like uh, if you think about the the, the set itself, uh, like there were there were things that uh, I remember him asking uh, our 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 production designer Ra. Uh, just like panels in the walls, because we knew that like those panels would give us the chance to to, to create a frame within a frame, you mm -hmm. know, and 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 things like that. Well, you have um, an incredible amount of texture. Like there's there's a lot of texture in. First of all, just European cities, regardless, they yeah, just give you a ton yeah. of texture. The house was you know uh, art directed to a point where there's wallpaper everywhere, and you've got really stunning colors and woodwork and all this. So you always had stuff that could fill the frame and make it beautiful. But decisions yeah. still had to be made to have negative space or to put somebody on like the bottom left corner of the frame. I mean, can you talk to us maybe a little bit about, let's just isolate that shot, the shot of, um, you know, Jojo and Rosie uh, in that park. What does that, now how does that support the storytelling um, to have them on the bottom frame? Was there any thought about that? Or did it just look cool and you just wanted to do it? I mean, it's a little bit of, of everything. It, 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 it did look cool. We, 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 we liked the, the architecture of that, uh, that dam there by the river and the, the stairs. And, and, and it felt really, really right to place them really, really small within the frame instead of just uh, using a, a really long lens and like frame them like center or, or um, any, anything like that, you know. Yeah, I, watching it, I was thinking to myself, are they just going to let this whole scene live in the wild? <laughs> Which honestly, I would have loved. Like I was, yeah, I was kind of, yeah. I almost was kind of bummed out when you went to the close up because I was like, oh, <laughs> it, I just, I personally like that when people just let the scene live like that because it feels almost voyeuristic and it feels like you're, I don't know, you just, you're able to watch a performance differently when it's not edited. 
Uh, and it's just kind of one cohesive shot that I think it's different. It, it, it lets you, it draws you in a little bit. That, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it can, it can, it can work very well for, for certain scenes, but I think, it, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't miss it because it was, it was nice to, to go and see Rose's close up and, and have all that beat with, uh, with the shoelaces and, and everything is in being, being able to see that up close. Well, you had to. You had to get a focus on yeah. on shoes. And I actually wanted to talk a little bit about that because shoes play a really important role in this movie. Um, we have foreshadowing with the mother's shoes earlier in the film. There's a whole uh, storyline about how um, young Jojo, you know, is unable to tie his shoes. It's we're constantly going back to the shoe thing. And, and ultimately, when he finds out that his mother is dead, it's through seeing her shoes uh, as she's, you know, hanging from the town square. So when you have a prop like that, that is extremely important to the story and there's foreshadowing involved, how were you incorporating your, how are you, how were you able to craft your cinematography in a way where those shoes were prominent? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's something that uh, uh, Taika knew from the beginning that he he wants the and then he he told uh, all of us like how important it is to 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 make the audience aware that those are Rosie's shoes and there is no question about it. Right? So for for us, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's very easy to just like lower the camera and shoot a close up of, of, of her shoes. But for us, it was a much bigger challenge and it was trying to find locations where that will happen naturally. Like, like her dancing on a, on a, on a ledge that's exactly like uh, Jojo's height uh, or, or, or in the pool where we had those steps. So you see her shoes first and then she, she, she steps down and goes into a, into a close up. Uh, so we were constantly looking for elements like this instead of saying like, oh, okay, for that scene, I need like three uh, close-up of the shoes. And I think it was much more effective because it, it, it wasn't like in the audience's face from, from the beginning, you know, it was like slowly kind of, you, you would get to know that. And by the time the, the, uh, the scene where he discovers his mother happened, uh, you know, and there's no doubt that those are her shoes. And mm -hmm. that was really, really smart, I think, because you don't need to show anything else. And like, there's so much emotion in that scene and the fact that you can stay with Jojo and understand exactly what happened without any other elements, I think that was great. You don't need to see her face. You know exactly what happened. Yep. And it's shocking. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. The, the, way, the way the shoes enter the frame was really jarring too. The sound design at that moment was jarring and kind of takes us back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier about how you combine these kind of happy moments and, um, you know, pair them pretty drastically to these horrific moments. Um, yeah. yeah. It was just exceptionally well done. I really, I really, really love that. And I think, um, you know, the performances were absolutely stunning. Like, I cannot believe what you guys got out of these child actors. I'm blown away. I mean, they were just no. so good. I mean, obviously, all the acting was fantastic. Um, but the child actors, to get that kind of emotion out of them, I mean, what does that take? I think uh, going back to what we, we spoke earlier, just, uh, just having that uh, um, approach where you don't... Uh, I mean, sometimes we had to, but as much as possible, we're trying to avoid just going there in the morning and say like, okay, Roman, you have to stay here and look this way. And, uh, you know, it's like giving them all the freedom in the world and, and, and watch them rehearse and, and uh, get ideas from, from where they, they are going in, in that space. Uh, I think that that was part of it. And, uh, we a lot of times it was so so much more interesting for us as well to just see where things are going and try different things instead of just limiting them to 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 a specific uh, um, portion of the room or or a, or a specific uh, place. Well, how do you do that? Like as 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 the cinematographer, as the director of photography for this, how do you create an environment that lets you know that lets the actor sort of use the space? I mean, uh, it's 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 challenging at times because you you don't want to overleap the whole space, you know. So it's like and and 
it's okay if sometimes there are moments where they go in a, in a darker spot. But what, what was really interesting is like if you're open to it and if you, if you embrace this whole approach and you realize that that's for the, uh, like it can make the scene and the whole movie much better, then you, you end up getting so many more interesting ideas. Like I remember there was, there was one of the first scenes between Jojo and, and, and Elsa in the, in the bedroom. And uh, I, I remember I was like watching the, the first rehearsal from, from the hallway kind of outside of the room. And I was trying to figure out uh, what is happening and where, they want to go and then the the second rehearsal i watched it from inside the room and i realized like oh my god just roman set in the perfect spot in between those three mirrors so i can have three reflections of outside like that's that's perfect like uh, why would i ask him to do anything different than that it's just a matter of where like you place your camera to observe what what they're doing but a lot of times we would get amazing ideas from just watching them rehearse the scene or just reading the lines and just walk through the room. What are some of the things that you have to do differently when you're working with child actors that people may not know? Uh, I mean, uh, with, with Roman, it's so, it, it, I, I, I was thinking of what would that be, but then I realized like his father is, is a, is a great cinematographer. So I'm pretty sure he grew up with, with cameras pointing at him all the time. So with him was fairly easy because he was used to cameras. He was used to dollies. He was used to all, Who's all his that, father? that stuff. Ben Davies, he shot three billboards, three billboards, right? Oh my God, no way. Yes. I didn't yeah. put it together. Yeah. yeah. So for, for, from that perspective, it was, it was amazing. Like, uh, I couldn't believe it. Like, yeah, it's a big camera, of course. Like, he grew up about, <laughs> around big cameras. Oh, yeah. So he must be used to it. But just in general, like, is there, like, does it change the structure of your shoot day? Does it, you know, add any complexity that otherwise wouldn't if you were using all adults? No, it does. I mean, it, it does change it because, of course, like, even even we get tired after after eight hours. So yeah. if, you, if you think about it, it's like, yeah, the... the the younger the actor, the, the the faster that thing will will happen. Then you wanna you wanna plan your day accordingly and not leave like really hard scenes towards the, the end of the day. And and knowing that there are certain uh, moments where they will need a break and and so on. So uh, from that perspective, yeah, you have to to plan ahead and and, and try to figure out how how to make it work. And um, but it's it's they were all amazing. I mean, it wasn't, uh, we were thinking about it in, in prep, uh, but then it kind of like, uh, we, we never thought about it again. You know, it was like, of course, like our first AD and, and the production team were working hard to make everything happen and then solve the whole, the whole puzzle. But I, I never felt that like, Oh, I wish it, we would have another, another hour or two. You know, we, we, we made it work in the end. Let's take a quick break and talk about PostLab. PostLab is a collaboration tool for Final Cut Pro 10, and it enables users to share libraries, track and save changes, and make sure that no more than one person is working on the same library simultaneously. And what that means is zero conflicts, plus a recallable history of your project. Now listen, people. If you are like me and you love Final Cut Pro 10, you use Final Cut Pro 10. You need PostLab. It's just as simple as that. You just do. This is the collaboration that we've always wanted from Final Cut 10. Yes, you've been able to collaborate. I mean, I certainly have before PostLab. But PostLab makes it seamless, zero conflicts, reliable. It's the best. Uh, it's a perfect combination of a cloud service, but also a desktop app. Because PostLab always makes sure that you're working off a local copy. So you don't need to be connected to the internet to be using PostLab. In fact, when you're using PostLab, you kind of don't even know you are because you're working on your libraries as you are, as you always have, right? But in addition to that, you get that fantastic cloud service that is custom built for Final Cut Pro libraries. And if you guys have uh, tried to put libraries on cloud services before, you know it doesn't always work that great. But with PostLab, they have a cloud built for Final Cut Pro libraries, and that makes all the difference in the world. So you get amazing collaboration opportunities. And here's the best part. You get three months free simply by going to gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. Gocreativeshow.com forward slash 
Post Lab. So take advantage for yourself. If you are a Final Cut Pro 10 user, you have to be a Post Lab user. You're going to be so happy that you did. And you get three months free at gocreativeshow.com forward slash Post Lab. Let's take a few minutes and talk about the um, uh, cinematography, lighting of Jojo Rabbit. I want to start with the camera package that you chose to shoot on. Um, can you tell us what it was and how you came to that decision? We, uh, we, we, we were doing a lot of camera tests just to, to pretty much choose our, our canvas and, and figure out what would be the best aspect ratio to, to tell Jojo's story. And we trade everything from 133 to, to 240 to times anamorphic. And um, we we loved the idea of trying one three three just because both Taika and I loved Ida so much, and, and we realized that there would be a an aspect ratio that would be really appropriate for for that period. But as we were testing, we realized that uh, it's it's not. I mean, it works really well for uh, for a story when you're like centered around one character, but having two characters that, that have a certain distance away from each other at the beginning, it was, it felt that it was showing too much ceiling and too much floor sometimes. And slowly we, we, we kind of eliminated a few of the, of the formats and the two four Oh, two times and a more it, it, it was, it felt that we were trying too much and it was feeling overly cinematic. So we, that's how we landed in at, at one eight five. And, we we loved what 185 would do for our framing, but in the same time, we both were, were missing that anamorphic quality from from the two two four oh two times anamorphic, and uh, we <coughs> we realized that um, there is an interesting way where you you use uh, the the hawk lenses, and there are other lenses that were made uh, with a one point three squeeze factor, mm. and they were made for 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 getting a 240 image but starting from like a 16 by 9 uh, sensor or, or or 16 millimeter negative uh, but if you if you start with a more squarish sensor uh, you can get a very close to 185 truly anamorphic and that's what we did you you, you get like 1.9 uh, something so it's with minimal cropping you you get a 185 anamorphic so our final package was uh, made of, of two Alexa SXTs with uh, with with Hawks V Light uh, 1.3x, and uh, there was the main. And I think what it did for us, uh, uh, it it uh, it gave us all those amazing anamorphic qualities, like almost velvet-like skin tones and and the 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 bokeh, like the the highlights in the in the background. Uh, and, and everything, all the flares, and, and all those uh, interesting fall-offs at the at the edges of the frame. So I think that was the perfect. Uh, it was the first time I've done I've done it this way because uh, it's like there are not too many movies that were shot one eight five anamorphic. Hmm. No, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember the last time I heard that on the show, and um, it sounds it sounds pretty unique. There, there was. I mean, I was trying to find the, the because the the use of the one point three V lights is like it's fairly common in the in the in the, in the TV world. But the uh, the only other movie I could find and and knew about it was uh, Promised Land, and uh, they they shot on on film but with the one point three uh, V lights. Hmm. What did you um, decide on for lenses? Seems like there's quite a few quite a few wide shots in there. Yeah, I mean, um, I always like to to carry a set of sphericals when I'm when I'm shooting anamorphics, and 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 the main reason is uh, even even a forty anamorphic uh, will will distort quite a lot in in, in a certain in an interior space, but even even outside might might do that. So <clears throat> I'm always trying to 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 keep a few uh, wide spherical lenses for for that purpose. Yeah, um, and uh, but. What was interesting is that we we realized that the Vantage has this amazing spherical uh, set called T1, and they are basically lenses that can open to a T1. So we we were carrying a full set of that of those, and and the reason was that we 
we we're we're talking about a lot uh, how would we approach the lighting in, in Elsa's hideout, and we realized like a bare bulb won't be appropriate for that. Would be probably something like a candle or a petrol lamp. And of course, if uh, if you tell that to to any cinematographer, they will <laughs> certainly think of Barry Lyndon right away and the challenge that that might uh, might be. And we 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 decided to use the T ones for those two scenes between Rosie and um, and Elsa. And we actually used a petrol lamp and and two candles as our our key light for the for those scenes. We had to add a few a few LED small LED pads to just have the the light wrap around the faces a little bit, but mainly the the key lights were the, the petrol lamp and the, the candles. I'm looking at the Vantage One uh, lenses right now. I'm not familiar with this brand, but I see they're associated with Hawk. Is it is it another Hawk brand? It is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, basically, uh, um, Vantage is the the main company that builds the the Hawks and uh, the, the Vantage One and oh, all, all the others. So, okay. Yeah. So there we are. Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. I'll put a link to this in the show notes so you guys can sure. check it out. Um, and that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the spaces. Yes, you you did make them on a set. You know, the house, whatever. So you had some control, but it still seemed like pretty tight spaces. Um, you yeah, know, it seemed like yeah. you had to be wide for quite a bit of it. Yeah. And we, I mean, uh, a, a lot of times like you tend to overdo and oversize some, some of the rooms when you, when you build them. But on the other hand, you don't want to go too, too big because you, you want to, and especially for the, for the hideout, we, we kind of restrained ourselves. And the idea was that like, as long as we can feed two people and the camera there, we are fine. We don't need more, more room. And, and Rod did an amazing job building that that space and make mm. it like a part of a, of an attic uh, that's like close to the bedroom. So uh, it's it's always a fine balance that you you you, you need to find because it's it sounds great at the beginning that the fact that you can have a wall that's wild and you can move it and place the camera in a, in a, in a position where you won't be able to in a real location. But a lot of times that takes more time that you'll you'll think to do that but also it's like it it kind of goes to 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 a certain feeling a, a lot of times even if it's a stage build i like to have ceilings and that's a that, that's a certain restriction i feel that is too much of a cheat if you if you put lights over a, a wall you know yeah and I, th I think you need certain restrictions sometimes so you can find interesting solutions to, to get out of that you had a picture on your Instagram of your camera with plastic wrap around the outside of it. Um, <laughs> talk to me about that. <laughs> what was that for? That's, uh, that's that's a new project I'm uh, I'm working on, and uh, it's it, it's interesting. It's this uh, is this amazing still photographer called David Burnett, and uh, I'm I'm trying my best to to replicate uh, <laughs> some of his work, uh, but he's. He's using um, uh, a four by five camera, so he's shooting large format yeah. uh, with with an amazing lens made by Kodak in the forties called the Arrow Ektar. Uh, so uh, what that does, it's 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 a very specific uh, lens that was built for surveillance planes, and it has uh, it's a radioactive lens. It has live thorium uh, in the coating. So. Really. Yeah, it's it's a look it up. It's a really interesting one that. And, what and was it called again? I'll look it up now. Uh, it's called uh, Aero Ektar, ah, and uh, just to have an idea, that that lens is a two point five uh, in, in large format. If you get a five six, uh, you have a good lens. So uh, that's kind of where 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 that uh, live thorium helps. <laughs> well, what what was the plastic doing? Well, the plastic was kind of recreating, like with a, with a large format camera. As soon as you you move or you tilt your lens a little bit, you create a certain, um, uh, uh, like a certain out of focus area and a fall off is more drastic. Yeah. So I was trying to replicate that uh, that out of focus thing with pl plastic wrap. It, it didn't work as great as I, I thought it would, uh, but uh, it's it's interesting. I enjoy kind of 
trying to find solutions like crazy solutions for 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 certain things like that. Well, you know, I I didn't look at the date of the photo, so I just assumed yeah. it was part of Jojo Rabbit and I no, thought no, and, it wasn't. Well, you know the part that I thought it was being used in is um right after jo- uh, Jojo gets hit by his own um grenade, there's a sequence yeah. where he's like being rushed to the hospital and this and that and it's all kind of distorted around the edges. I thought that was it. No, that's that's very similar though. We 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 use the lens baby for for that. And, that uh, was a lens baby. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. And the reason is, I mean, we had uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, tilt and shift lenses, but with, with the lens baby, what we did, we basically unscrew those, those, those three screws that, that hold the, and will we'll, we'll make, we we'll, will we'll make you uh, be able to just like lock the lens. So we unscrew those and we're just by holding the lens and move it the way we want it within the shot. That, that was a lens baby. Yeah. Wow, I haven't thought about Lens Baby in such a long time. They were, I mean, they were so popular, like, for a while. Maybe they still are, I don't know. But I feel like when they first got released, it was, I mean, that was a huge thing. I'm on their site right now. I'll put a link to this in the show notes. The idea of kind of doing these practical effects, you know, right on the lens, adding these interesting filters, um, you know, I I love all this. I think it's really, really cool. I'm, I'm glad to hear that they're being used in, you know, at the highest levels of filmmaking like you. That's that's fantastic. It's, I mean, it's interesting because you can actually find a, a Les Baby kit with the, with a peel mount. So <laughs> that wasn't as complicated as like trying to find a, like sometimes we find strange ways to, to put like a Nikon mount lens on a movie camera. But uh, like, yeah, the Les Baby, you can actually find it in a, in a peel mount now. I want to talk a little bit about the filtration. I mean, now that we're kind of on the topic, um, can you talk to us about the filter sets that you used on Jojo Rabbit, if you did at all? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm kind of, uh, especially when it comes to anamorphic lenses and, and or like interesting specialty lenses. I, I'm trying to solve that problem. I'd rather do it with with finding an interesting lens than mm. than filter. Uh, I, I I do use sometimes uh, black setting or or classic soft, but. Most of the times, I'm, uh, I'm 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 trying to not to and and trying to 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 find interesting glass that will will do that, like interesting lenses. Um, of course, when you when you're in a, in anamorphic, your your limitations are are the minimum focusing distance. But these these hawks are pretty good at it, and and also like if you if you work with uh, with with diopters, then like now I. Um, for like a few years now, um, Schneider made the the, the one eighth and the quarter uh, diopter, so that will allow you to 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 have a um, to drastically extend the, the the minimum focusing distance. Anamorphic can still be able to to focus fairly deep, not uh, not to infinity, but at least like forty or thirty feet away. Were you adding any like smoke to the room or anything to kind of give it that that kind of creamy richness? No, I think that that was mainly the the quality of the of the lenses. We 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 tried a little bit. It's so so tricky to to keep it consistent. Like I think we tried for the first two three days, and I found myself later kind of fighting it and trying to enhance contrast so so it doesn't look too milky. Yeah. Um, it's it, haze and and smoke. They're always always tricky. Of course, like we embraced it a lot in the in the final battle scenes, but. Interiors, we um, we end up going with, without. I mean, we tried it a day or two. I think. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine consistency being hard um, when you're doing that. I guess. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, it does create an interesting look. But I think you know, now thinking back to the way that you know Jojo Rabbit looked, it did have such yeah. a deep richness in the colors that it couldn't have had that much in there. Yeah. Yeah. Can you point us to maybe the most challenging scene of the film for you and how you overcame that challenge? Ah, uh, it's it, it's a tough one. I mean, there there wasn't anything. I, I guess the the towards the the end of the movie, the the war scenes were were challenging. But and Why? there was a there was a particular shot that we we really wanted to 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 do in one. And uh, when when Jojo runs. Uh, to find a hiding spot, and uh, I guess it's like uh, sometimes. And what's really uh, what I what I love about the whole process is 
uh, finding solution for for everything. And a lot of times, what you plan doesn't uh, doesn't turn out the way you would want. Mm-hmm. So, but for this specific scene, we really wanted to to do it in one shot, and it was it was challenging because there were so many elements involved and everything needed to line up perfectly and it was one of those that like by by take two we lost all the hope and we slowly gained it back by take three <laughs> or four and by take five or six we got it and we, we moved on but it was very challenging because we had a, a bunch of explosions and just a reset time for the special effects team for that was 30 minutes when you when you think about uh, six takes times 30 minutes it's kind of Eating up a lot of for sure, a lot of your day. Yeah. Luckily, we were doing a, a little bit of second unit in the same area with some other elements, so we could still do something while they were re, re, resetting the, the the explosion. Uh, but that that felt uh, that we might not be able to achieve it, and it's really frustrating. We want something and it doesn't doesn't work, but we we made it work in the end, so that was good. Well, Jojo Rabbit. Absolutely incredible film. I really, really liked it. Um, like I said, I just finished watching it today. It was just, it just really grips you. And, um, you know, certainly no surprise that it's up for best picture uh, in 2020. Like, what does that feel like when you get, when you find out that your film could potentially be film of the year? I mean, that just has got to be one of those mind blowing moments. It, it it felt great. I mean, it's 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 one of those like the 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 more people will get to watch it, the, the better. That's what we all what we can hope for. Certainly, but there's got to be something. Yes, you want more people oh. to watch it, but you personally like what? That's that's an experience that just such so few people in the world get to have, and that's you're true. and you're having it right now. Like, did you did you expect it? Did you get kind of like a pit in your stomach, nervous and feeling, or what does it feel like? It, it it was i mean it's so so hard and so but it's so interesting i think it's like we 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 never think about uh, about that while while shooting but it's it's definitely something that we we hope for when during the award season and yeah. i think i think i think Giorgio got so much recognition and it's it's great but it's like and what that does it brings more more people into the theater and more people interested to to watch it and that's what i'm thinking it's like it it it, it works both ways and it's like it it gives uh, gives us the the chance to to have more like a bigger audience. That's that's the best part of it. Well, I can only assume Go Creative Show listeners are probably up on you know the the big films of the year. So you guys, anybody listening's probably seen the film. But look at this: um, best film editing, best production design, costume design, adapted screenplay, supporting actress, best picture um, nominations. Um, and hopefully, hopefully wins. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just so great for you. I, I'm, I'm happy for you. Like I'm, I'm psyched for you. You came back, uh, you came back on the show. You were here for, um, the hate you give, which was also a great film coming back now, even stronger. Like I just, I'm psyched for you. This is great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what, what's next for you? How do you top this? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I see uh, every, every new project as a, as a new challenge. A new puzzle to solve. So I, I, I enjoy everything, and I, I I never really try to think that way. It's more about uh, trying to find what would like be more exciting for for each project. And I'm 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 trying my best not to compare them and not to and to like leave them behind as like a nice uh, nice memory, you know, and just go forward and to see what's next. Well, you're a better man than me. I'm co- all, all I would be doing is I'd be sitting in my room no. nervous and shaking and being like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do something better than this? I, I've hit, I've hit the pinnacle. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm trying my best. I don't know if it's, I don't think I'm a better person. I'm just like trying my best not to. And, yeah, that's true. You I didn't say, you didn't it, say you yeah. achieved it. You said you're trying. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> a big distinction there. <laughs> Mihai Malimar Jr. Thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. Again, we really appreciate it. Your work is so great and uh, you're always Thank fun you to so talk much. to. And um, I, I'm already looking forward to uh, your next appearance for the next big film. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. uh, Thank you. All right. I want to thank Mihai Malimar Jr. for coming back on the show to talk about his work on 
Jojo Rabbit. What a great film. If you guys haven't seen it, go see the film. It's really, really, really good. Funny. Uh, it's got a lot of heart to it. It's, it's just great. It really is fantastic. So I can see why it's getting all the accolades. And fingers crossed, we'll see. Maybe he'll, next time he comes on the show, he'll be an Oscar winner. I mean, how great would that be? I also want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gainstructure.com, at gainstructure.com, and hire him for your own projects. But don't hire him too much because I use him for my stuff. So if I call him and he's saying, oh, no, I'm working on a project for a Go Creative Show listener, I'm going to say, damn you. I also want to thank uh, Connor Crosby for producing the show and getting all the great guests and keeping the whole train running. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com, ignitionvisuals.com. Of course, you should be following us on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, because A, we let you know what's going on with the show. B, we give you an opportunity to have your question heard on the show. And C, we post a lot of fun stuff, you know? So just go there and check it out for yourself. And if you love behind the scenes stuff, and I know you do, uh, you should be following me as well. I've been posting a lot of behind the scenes of my own projects and people seem to be enjoying that. So it's all there at gocreativeshow.com. That's the place to start. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. All right, guys, I want to thank our sponsors, Rule Boston Camera and Post Lab. Thank you guys for supporting the show and thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.